So as Casey said, my name is Jenny Leroy. Um, I currently work for the Faculty of Science, Engineering and Technology. And my role at the moment is Manager for Engagement and, and Outreach. Um, and so we run lots of different programs for um, schools, for teachers. Um, we coordinate National Science Week, Inspiring Australia, which is a national science engagement initiative. Um, and before I was involved in this role, I'm coming from a science background. So I used to be a marine biologist working at CSIRO. Um, and I, yeah, I like talking about science, so that's why I ended up in science communication. Um, so if at any stage today, I don't have too long, just let me know. Um, okay, so science inquiry. If I say to you science inquiry, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? Project. Lovely. Experimental design. Beautiful. Anything else that pops into your mind? Investigation. Investigation. Yeah. So investigation. Sorry? Fair tests. Fair tests. Oh, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else that pops into your mind? If I ask... Um, experiments. Yep. If I asked you for like some of the key steps. So we've had a few already. Like fair testing. You know, what if we're going to do a science inquiry, what are some of the um, things that we need to do, think about? Oh, Ask a question. Lovely. Yep. Oh, that's the same thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably the, probably the first thing. Definitely. But where does the question come from? Observation. Observation. Absolutely. So we've observed. We've hypothesised. What have we done next? Research. Yep. Some research and identifying variables. Identifying variables. Yep. Looking at the experimental design. Okay. And then what do we do? Plan. Planning, planning is very important. Doing some pilot work is very important. Yeah, there's a couple there, and then we need to do something after that. That's the important thing, in my opinion, the most important thing. Give us <laughs> the, the data. data. Collect the data, yeah. Yep, yeah. yeah. collect the data, then what do we do? Analyze it. Analyze it, yep. Yeah. And risk assessment. Risk assessment, <laughs> good one. Yeah, yeah. Probably should have done back at the pilot study stage. Sorry, what's that? Oh, I'm conclusion. Conclusion, <laughs> definitely. No much point in doing all of this unless you can bring all the data together, analyze the data, have a conclusion. And there's something else that we need to do after we've done all that too. <laughs> Communicate your findings. Communicate your findings, okay? So hopefully, if I've done a bit of a summary, I'll look back. Um, so if we've done a bit of a summary, we've covered all of those key points. And that communication of your findings is one of the key points for the science investigation board. And again, as a scientist, um, doing the experimental work, planning it, that's always the fun part, running it up, not the fun part. But um, it's a really important part of doing a science investigation because you have to collate all that information, come up with those conclusions, and then share it to a wider audience, whoever that wider audience is. Okay, so I think everyone's got a pretty good idea of the key um, steps within um, science inquiry. So what the next thing I was going to do was just take you through an example of science inquiry in real life. Because what your students are doing as part of this, they're mimicking what scientists do. They, they're the scientific method, okay, which is universal really, um, around that investigation. So I'm going to put it in context of what I did. So I was, a, my, as I said, a marine biologist and I studied algae, these tiny little single cell plants. Um, that swim around in the ocean, really important because they produce lots of oxygen. If we didn't have algae, we wouldn't be breathing. Um, they're also part of the food chain, so really important. So in the lab, we used to culture them up, um, single cell cultures. Um, so one species in each flask. Um, we'd grow them up to larger amounts so that they could then be used to feed um, prawns and oysters. So we'd be using the algae to feed the oyster, um, oyster larvae. And then when the oysters form the spat, they'd then be sold off to the nursery in the to grow a bit bigger and then they'd go out to the farmers. Um, we were also supplying these cultures around Australia, so we were supplying oyster hatcheries, pearl oyster hatcheries, uh, prawn hatcheries. So it was really important that we could grow the algae up in those large amounts, otherwise the young baby animals would go hungry and the farmers wouldn't be happy because they wouldn't be getting a supply and so on down the food chain. Um, so one of the very one of the very first projects that um, I was involved with, we were looking at. So we had these ten species that were known to be good food for oyster larvae, right? Particularly oyster larvae, and we were sending them off to hatcheries all around Australia. And people would ring us up and say, "Hey, on, my algae is not growing in my bag. My baby oysters are hungry. What do I do?" Um, and so here's the observation. Okay, so the observation was around the feedback that people weren't able to grow up their microalgae um, to feed their feed their animals. So we thought, okay, well we've got 10 species that are commonly used around the world, that's why we're using them. 
maybe we need to look at are they best for particular environmental conditions. So maybe we need to look at the environmental conditions behind these. So because they're plants, um, when you grow them up, you need light, obviously, because they photosynthesize. They're grown up in seawater, um, so you have a constant in terms of the growth media that they grow in. Um, and you also monitor with light, you monitor day, uh, day and night temperatures. So even when they're grown up in hatcheries, they get 12 hours of light, light goes off, they go to sleep, 12 hours of dark. Um, so that's the sort of standard, the things that we do want to change, the things that are our, um, our, our constants. But what we did want to look at was effective temperature. That was the first thing, because particularly if we're sending um, algae to places like Western Australia or Broome or warmer places, um, we're also thinking that okay, these are the ten new, the ten standard species. Maybe there's new species out there that we could go and look at, and maybe they might be better oyster um, larval food. So that was the other component of the project. So from our observation, our question was around basically what's the best oyster, best algae to feed our oyster larvae, and best in this particular case, we were looking at um, different environmental conditions. And there's a little map down there that basically shows you where we were sending these cultures all around Australia. Um, and some were doing well and some weren't and we wanted to try and get a bit more of a handle on that. Um, so this here is a typical elbow growth curve, okay? So again, getting into the data collecting stage, we're going to be looking at, um, so when you start a culture, you've got one microalgae that divides, makes two, exponentially grows. Um, and so over time, so here's your days, uh, here's your numbers of cells. Um, you can see that this particular species here is a bit of a slow grower, um, not getting up to as many cell numbers as, um, say, these, these species up here. So that's the typical result that we were looking at when we were doing the growth curve. So here was our test. Um, we were looking, as I said before, um, we were taming different temperatures. So we had replicates. We had three sets of flasks at so 10 degrees, 15 degrees, 20 degrees, 25 degrees. And our other environmental conditions such as light, our growth media, our day left, we kept constant. And every, every day we'd come in and count each of those flasks just to start building up those growth curves. And what we found, we found that our species, our 10 species that we were using, they fell into particular groups, okay? We had the ones that were pretty good at all temp um, so each of these little dotted lines refers to a different temperature. So this group of species, species A I'll call them, basically they do pretty well at all temperatures, okay? Maybe a little bit slow here, but at the end of the day you're ending up with the same biomass. They're the hardy ones. They're the ones that we think, right, we can send them all around Australia, they're going to be good. We've got this lot of species over here, not doing very well at 10 degrees. Don't grow them in Tassie, okay? So doing better at higher temperatures. Um, so they're the ones we'd be saying, don't want to send to our local farmers because they're going to be really slow at 10 degrees. We've got this group over here um, that also did okay um, at 10 degrees were quite slow, but they took off. So maybe we could use them but probably not. They're still a bit slow at 10 degrees. They're not temperate species. They're more for the subtropical, tropical areas. So they're still doing better at the higher temperatures. Group of species D crashed out at 30. Don't send them to Queensland. Okay, and that was really useful because um, there was that particular species was crashing out for the prawn farmers, and it's now standard practice that we have an Australian species um, that does really well at high temperatures, and we don't use the standard worldwide species. Um, and then species E, well, they do okay, but they crash out pretty quickly, so probably not the most hardy ones. So there are our results, there are our analysis that we could then apply as to what species we provided to which um, places around Australia so that everyone could get their nice oysters. Um, so yeah, so basically, as I said, we're looking for, so what makes, coming back to our question around what makes the best edible species, we're looking for something that's got a relatively fast growth rate because we don't want to have to wait for ages for our algae to grow up in the bags because then there's not enough feed for the oyster larvae. So fast growth rate, wide temperature range for growth, pretty good. Um, other things that we looked at, we looked at um, different light intensities because obviously if you have to give them lots of light, it's a bigger bill um, when you're trying to um, grow them up in hatcheries. So things that didn't need heaps of light, low light were better. Um, we did a whole lot of nutritional analyses as well. Each of these species got analysis looked at for its um, fatty acid content, for its uh, protein and carbohydrate value, and obviously you don't want to feed into the toxic. So these are all the other things that came out of that original observation, original question, why are some species doing better when we send them off to different hatcheries? And the first thing we looked at temperature, but all these other things came out of it. And how do we communicate these findings? Um, obviously, you do, as a scientist, you do your papers in your peer-reviewed journals or in your books. 
uh, and that's equivalent to students writing out their reports. Conference presentations and posters, and again, that's what we ask the students to do as part of the Science Investigation Award, to actually come up with a poster that illustrates key points from their findings. And we also ran our workshops for aquaculture staff, so we could inform them about what species grew best for their particular conditions. And that was a real, um, so that provided um, a very strong basis for the industry, something that, um, again, through, that SIRA was able to um, coordinate and get that information out to everyone. So that's just an example of how we use the scientific method in real life to come up with a solution for oyster farmers in terms of what sort of microalgae we provided. And again, it's amazing with, with the science investigation awards that I've seen students do in previous years, um, it's amazing the number of real life applications that you find in those as well. Um, okay, so as I said, the science investigation awards gives the students the opportunity to, to go through that scientific process to be a scientist themselves. One of the great things about the Science Investigation Awards is that they can, um, depending on um, guidance from teachers, but they've got that ownership of the project. Um, so that gives you that engagement. They're investigating something potentially that they're interested in. I remember a group of girls down in Hobart looked at um, uh, nail polish and how well that stayed on your fingers and they took photos of fingers and pixelated it and examined each little pixel every time to and then did the um, area calculation to really analyse, you know, how good was each different types of nail polish. Um, so it's giving them that engagement in something that they're interested in. Um, as part of this, as part of the process, obviously they get to learn the science, the content around what they're investigating. And again, this can vary from, um, you might have a particular stream that you want them to focus on. So a teacher might say something like marine science, but students might have different investigations as part of that bigger theme area. And that again can link into the Australian curriculum. Um, with the Science Investigation Awards, students can work on their own or in groups of two or three. So working in a group obviously encourages that teamwork and that is key in science as well. There's very few scientists these days that work on their own. You're normally part of a team. It's normally a fairly large team. Um, and being able to work with different people and share your results is a really important skill. Students have to think about, as do um, teachers, around their resourcing and their organisation. I'm glad to hear someone bringing up um, uh, OH&S and doing risk assessment. It's really important. Um, they have the opportunity to learn their research skills, think logically, and most importantly, communicate their results. Because as I said, as a scientist, it's really important to get the message out there about your findings. Um, and this is a great way of being able to do it. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an example, practical demonstration around science.